Okay, so, so I have shared, shared with, with everybody, everybody in here, here. I, have I have been reading, reading Hebrews, Hebrews for the last couple, couple months, months and just, just reading, reading it over and over and over, and, over and, and, over and there, there is a lot of good stuff in Hebrews. Stuff in Hebrews. If, if you, you haven't, haven't ever just read through Hebrews and, and asked God, God to reveal to you um, what, what it really means, I have, have heard, heard a lot of people say that, that you know, when they were in other churches that people said Hebrews was hard to understand. I think, I think it's because it's, it's packed, packed with a lot, lot of things, things of where we're heading, heading where, where we're, we're going, going in. Things, things of what, what God's, God's original plan was, was that, that we actually really don't walk or live, live in much yet. yet. <laughs> but God, God is calling the people to do that. that. Um, you, you know, know Mike, Mike had asked, asked a few weeks ago if, the, if, he, if, if we, we thought the church really knew what they were called to, well, there's a lot of stuff in Hebrews that tells us what we're called to. It tells us, you know, what God, and I think we're going to read it, there's a scripture in there that says, you know, you know, this, this was, was finished, finished from the foundation of the earth, earth and, and it says that God's just waiting for a people who will believe what he's, he's already done and planned. A people who will walk out what he's already done and planned. So, you know, it's, it's nothing new to God. It's what he's always wanted. It's new to us because we've been walking so much in the world. And he, little by little, is opening up things to us for us to see bigger and bigger the picture of what he originally intended for his people to walk in. And it's amazing. What God originally intended his people to walk in is amazing. It, it is like overwhelming sometimes, sometimes your brain can't hardly really even comprehend the goodness of what God is wanting to do. So, so you know, Bethel, Bethel talked about, about the worship, worship this morning being about, about him being worthy, worthy and, and, and his, his love, love and all that. But, but what, what I saw over and, and over again is because God has had me on this for a really long time was, was the cross and what Jesus did for us. And we don't, we don't want to stop there because the cross was where he, where he took, took it all, laid it all down, down but he, he came, came back, back resurrected, resurrected without, without it. it. And, and I'm, I'm not kidding, I can't, I can't even, I will not be able, able to put in words or give you everything he's shown me over the last year, year. But, but Jesus paid, paid a really, really high price. price. And, 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 and he's, he's really, really wanting to see a people that will walk in what he paid, paid for. for. And, and so, so I'm going to start out talking a little bit about that. I shared some of this Wednesday night, I didn't know if I would share it this morning, I felt like this is where God wanted me to start. Just, just because, because that's, that's the blood, blood of Jesus, Jesus was in almost every song, song we did, did up there. And, and the, the price, price that he paid on the cross, I'm not, not kidding. kidding. It's, it's overwhelming to think what he did, did for us. us. And, and, and you know, you know what? The, the song that, that, that we sang, sang this morning, he laid down, down his life, life okay? okay? And, and, and you know, you just kind of think, well, yeah, but you know, he didn't die, he went to heaven and all that. But laying down his life is dealing with the same things that we're dealing with. Like, like, he, he laid, laid down, down his physical, present life. Well, what, what are, are we dealing, dealing with? Laying down, down our physical, present life. We have already had the promise that, promise that we're going to live forever, forever right? right? If, if we've, we've accepted, accepted him as our Lord, and we're walking in his ways, and we're following him, we've, we've already been promised everlasting life. life. So, so what, what we are fighting and with every day is to lay down this physical part of us, so, so that, that we, we can walk it out everything that he's paid for. And, and that's, that's the same fight he had. And he did it as a man. Like, he was tempted in every way just as we are. So I'm going to talk a lot about blood and bleeding this morning. And you know, when blood is coming out of you, it's a scary thing, right? It's a scary thing. And I'm going to show you it's because the life is in the blood. And our our soul life is in the blood. It, it says in here, um, what I'm going to read is that, the blood represents our soul life. And if you think about it, if you bleed out and die, you lose your soul, right? You die. So it's a very scary thing. The blood represents the life. So bleeding, when you start bleeding, it's a very scary thing. You know, people can, they call it bleeding out, can bleed out and die, right? You can um, lose blood and lose parts of your body can die and have to be removed because they don't get enough blood. The blood of Jesus that flows in our veins is very, very important. And, and when, when you think about it, when, when we're bleeding, we do everything we can to stop it, right? Because we don't want to bleed out. He willingly gave his life and bled so that we could take on his life and live forever, right? He had to, and again, everybody's like, well, yeah, he was Jesus. Yeah, he knew. Okay. You, you can't, can't tell me he was tempted in every way that, that we were. So when he saw that blood coming, coming out of his body, he had the same fears and the same everything that tries to come on us when blood, blood is coming out of our bodies. Body. And, and like he did, did it willingly. He did it willingly first because he loved his father and second because his father wanted us redeemed and brought back to him. 
What an amazing thing. thing. God, God is too big. big. I, I cannot, cannot put it in words what God's been showing you with this. It, it is too big what he's done, done for us. He paid a very high price for what, what we're supposed to be walking in. And then we're going to start reading some stuff about how much we still walk in just the elementary things, the, the small little things. Like, like every day we're walking in such small little things. And he's, he's saying we should have long ago been past that. Seriously, long ago. Okay, okay. so I'm going to start in Hebrews 12, 3. And I'm reading from the new Amplified Version. Just consider and meditate on him who endured from sinners such bitter hostility against himself. Consider it all in comparison with your trials, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet struggled to the point of shedding blood and striving against your sin. And you, you have forgotten the divine word of encouragement which he addressed to you as sons. My son, do not make light of the discipline of the Lord, and do not lose heart and give up when you are corrected by him. For the Lord disciplines and corrects those whom he loves, and he punishes every son whom he receives and welcomes to his heart. So first of all, I want to say, God calls that an encouragement. <laughs> he says, don't lose heart when you're being corrected and being disciplined, because he calls that an encouragement. And I, I'm serious, I have so much I don't know what I'm going to get to and not get to, so I'm just going to, as the things come into my mind as I'm talking, I'm just going to bring them up. Um, it's an encouragement when he corrects us. We... We have a hard time letting God see into us. You know, the shame, the, there was a song up there too talked about the shame, okay? When God's getting ready to correct us and discipline us, we have to look him in the face and know that he's looking into us. And it's not that he doesn't know. Like, he knows everything, right? He knows everything, everywhere, every how, every way that ever and will ever happen on the earth. He knows everything in every way, every how, every way that's ever happened to us. He knows everything in our heart that's right and everything in our heart that's wrong. It's like, like he doesn't see it. But he wants us to look face to face and trust him when we know he's looking into us and seeing how, far, fall, how short we are falling, Right? We look into those eyes, and he sets us free. And it's really hard when you are ashamed of what's in there. You're ashamed that you're not work, walking like you think you should. You're ashamed that you're not following him. It's really hard sometimes to look in his eyes. If you don't trust him, and you don't know his goodness, and you don't know that when you look into his eyes, and he sees those things, that he's going to set you free from them, and he's not ashamed of you. When he looks in there and sees that, and he sees you looking back at him, and he sees you letting him have a glance into what's going on in you, he is so excited. He's not ashamed of you. He's not mad at you. He doesn't want to beat you. He wants to set you free of that thing. And he is so excited when we look back into his eyes and say, here I am, all that I am. I might be a mess. I might have messed up five seconds ago. But God, I love you and I trust you and I'm going to open my eyes and look at you face to face because you paid a really high price for me to be set free of this, right? Consider it all in comparison to your trials. You have not yet struggled to the point of shedding blood in your striving. And originally, you know, and I still think so too, I, I thought about him in the Garden of Gethsemane and he shed blood there. He sweat blood. He was in such a struggle against sin that says you have not yet uh, shed blood in your struggle, um, shedding blood in your, in your striving against sin. So, like, God was asking him to go to the cross. God was asking him to willingly be stuck in the side and blood and water flow. God was willingly asking him to lay his life down to save mankind. Imagine, imagine. We think, oh, he was Jesus, no big deal. He suffered every temptation that we do. He felt it. He took our sins on his body. So he felt everything. And Mike said this to me one night. This is so real to me. Mike said this one night. I was talking about all the things that Jesus 
had went through in his life, and this is how he experienced temptation here, and this is how he experienced there. And Mike said, and he took every single individual thing that has happened to you. Paraphrasing, I don't know exactly the words he used. Everything you're struggling with, every fight that you have against sin, he took that. He felt that. He was, he was beyond human recognition. He didn't even look like a man anymore because every sin for every person in the world was on, he took on him. How? No wonder he sweat blood. How could you do that? How could you willingly say, okay, and I want you to stop thinking, oh, he was Jesus. Yes, he was Jesus. Yes, he was without sin. But he had to feel that and be tempted by that as a man. He took on, can you, uh, we're, we right now are human beings with flesh and blood with the spirit of God living inside of us. So imagine right now if that God asked that of you. I want you to take on every sin. Think of the struggles we've had with pain and agony and hurt and heartaches and brokenheartedness and all of the things. And think of the horrible stories that you've heard of people, things that have happened to people that are even unconceivable to imagine. And imagine saying, yes, I will take all of that because I love you, Father, and I want to see mankind set free. Like, I can't fathom it. I can't fathom it. So our little bitty, pitily little trials, number one, he already paid the price for them. And number two, we have not, we have not yet come to the place of shedding blood in our fight against sin. Like, that is an amazing savior. That is somebody that is worthy. We're worthy to lay our lives down for. Worthy to break the seals. Oh, worthy to open the scrolls. I said this in praise and worship this morning. Jesus is worthy to break every seal. Everything that is sealed up inside of us. God wrote a scroll of your lives before you were ever born. Of everything that he wanted you to accomplish on this earth. In the end result of bringing his kingdom to the earth. That's the main purpose. God wants to bring his kingdom, his rule, and his reign, and everything that he is, and all that he's paid the price for, he wants to bring to this earth. And he wants his church and his bride to walk in that, right? And there has been a scroll written for every one of your lives before you were even born, and some of that we've already messed up. Right? I'm sure he had things for us when we were younger and we were in our own little worlds and doing our own little thing. But thank you, God, that he's redemptive and he can still get us back on a path and we can still fulfill purposes that he has called for our lives. And I don't know how he does it. I don't know if it comes a different way. You still do the same purpose, it comes a different way. I don't know if he rewrites the whole story because you messed it up so bad, maybe. You know, if you were supposed to marry a certain person or have certain kids or do certain things and you didn't, that's probably not just going to magically happen, right? So he maybe he has to rewrite it, but he's still, he's so redemptive, he will still write us back into the purposes and plans that he has for us. And he's the only one worthy to break the seals. The enemy has sealed things up in us. The things that are supposed to be gods have been sealed up in us. And Jesus is the only one worthy to break that seal and open up that scroll and read and we're epistles to be read of all men. Our scrolls are to be opened up and read by this earth of what God's plans and purposes are. Ah, oh, amazing. Isn't that amazing? And the enemy is constantly coming at us trying to stop that. Every little thing, there's somewhere in Hebrews here, I think a couple times even, it talks about the, the sin that so, and mine says, cleverly and easily manipulates us or pulls us off. I'm not exactly sure what the word is, but... Easily. The enemy comes easily. Seriously. In the light of having to take on every sin and every curse and every sickness and every disease and every heartache and everything that has ever been done evil to mankind, how small are the things that we have to deal with? And we're so easily and cleverly, cleverly pulled off into these things. Our minds and hearts have to be on him. We have to keep our lives in, in tune with him. 
So, um, with, so then I said, you know, originally I had, ta- that's what I thought about, is him being in Gethsemane and that fight that he had. And so, such a strenuous fight that he had that he was sweating blood. Okay, seriously, if you look down and you were sweat was coming out blood, that'd be a little scary, wouldn't it? He had to deal with all those things that we would have to deal with and still say yes. And he said, Father, if this cup can be taken away from me, please take it away from me. Then he said, not my will, your will be done. Right? Okay, so then this morning as I'm thinking of all this, it's like, and I think I already said this too, but it was beyond that because he had to hang on the cross and they stuck him in the side with the sword and blood and water flowed. So there you go again. He's like, okay, I've heard, I don't know, I've not studied it out. I've heard that when they were hanging on the cross, they were so pulled that they would have to go up on their tiptoes. Like it was so much pressure on their lungs, they couldn't breathe. And they would have to push themselves up with their feet to get a breath of air in, right? Okay, you've got nails in your hands and feet. You've been stripped, not with a diaper on like that shows. You're stripped naked for all mankind to look at you. Right? You've been beaten so you don't even look like a man, and you're trying to take your last breaths like this, and they stab you in the side, and you can feel. I don't know if you could probably look down. See the blood pouring out of you. Imagine, imagine what that must have been like for him. And he still had to trust his father. He still had to look to what he was going to endure for the joy that was on the other side of it. And that's what, that's what he asks us to do. All these things, these little things that we're being asked to give up seem like nothing in the light of that. And we're supposed to look beyond that for the joy that was set before him, right? So with that, I wanted to go back and read into you. You don't have to turn here because it's just a short little scripture. In Leviticus, I just want to read to you about the life being in the blood. Um, Leviticus 17, 17 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by reason of the life which it represents. So what Jesus was doing, he was giving up his soul. And that's what he's asking us to do. Like I I said, I always thought before, well, he was Jesus. And yeah, he died. And yes, it was horrible. But, you know, he's going to live forever. And so, like, you know, it was just his soulish life here that he was giving up. Oh, my gosh. As you try to start giving up your soulish life, that's not easy. Right? He had to go through all the same feelings, all the same same temptations that we have to go through. Because our life is, was, he, he bled it out and gave up his soul so that we could live. So, and we're supposed to give up our souls and live for him. He gave up his life and soul for us. Now we're supposed to give up our lives and soul for him, right? And it wasn't God that demanded this. It was the enemy, right? It was the enemy that demanded this blood. All right, I'm going to go to um, Hebrews 9, 8. Maybe if I can see it. Got to be in the right one. So as you read through all before this, it it just, it it sets it up a lot of the old covenant and what happened. Like, um, you know, all the blood of the goats and the lambs and the things that that covered and all those things that that did in the old covenant. And what... I don't know. I, th- I always think Paul wrote this. I guess there's some discrepancy about that. But I always think it's Paul that wrote it. And um, what he was trying to do was get them to understand what all that represented in the Old Testament, right? said, so by the, and I'm in, did I tell you already? Nine, eight. By this, the Holy Spirit signifies that the way into the holy place, the true holy of holies, and the presence of God has not yet been disclosed as long as the first and outer tabernacle is still standing. That is, as long as the Levitical system of worship remains as a recognized institution. For the first and outer tabernacle is a symbol, that is, an archetype of the uh, paradigm 
for the recent time. I can't hardly see the, my Bible in here. These are smaller letters than my old one. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which are incapable of perfecting the conscience and renewing the inner self of the worshiper. For they, the gifts, sacrifices, and ceremonies, deal only with clean and unclean food and drink and various ritual washings, mere external regulations for the body imposed to help the worshipers until the time of reformation. That is the time of the new order when Christ will establish the reality of what these things foreshadowed, a better covenant. And then I'm going to move over to 22, 922. In fact, under the law, almost everything is cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, neither release from sin and its guilt, nor cancellation of the merited punishment. Okay, so we're going to talk in a little bit about the elementary things, right? The elementary things of God, and that he's wanting us to go deeper, and he's wanting us to move deeper. And that just said, there is no moving into the Holy of Holies as long as the outer, I think that was the inner courts, right? As long as the outer tabernacle is still standing. So that was, okay, so I, you have the outer courts, the inner courts, and the Holy of Holies. Holy of Holies is what we're trying to get to. That's where the presence of God dwells. That's where we want to dwell. We don't just want to go in and out like the priests did. We want to live there. We want to live in the presence of God. Right, But it says there is no getting into that place as long as the outer. So I think the outer court is out there where they don't even see who Jesus is. The inner court is where you see and you know who he is, but you don't step into what he did for you. Right. So as long as we're still out here in this part where we're doing everything by ritual, right? We're doing it. Mike taught, um, what was the word you used a while back? The difference between um, conforming and transforming. Right. When you're in the inner courts, You live in the conforming thing. You do it because somebody else said it. Like, I've heard, so I remember before I started serving God, okay, Jesus died on a cross. What does that mean for me? Like, I don't, that, big deal. What does that mean for me, right? I moved into the inner courts. Okay, I see what he did, how he paid for, you know, it paid for sin so that maybe I thought at first I could go to heaven or I could get rid of my sin or get what I wanted or whatever it was I thought, you know. But now we're moving into the Holy of Holies where we see what he really did for us. And we see what we can really walk in, the truth of where we can really go and what he really has planned for us. And as long as this inner court outside the Holy of Holies exists, as long as we stay in this place of doing everything by conforming, by rote, because somebody else said it, by his stripes you are healed, right? Heard that. I've heard people quote that since I started walking with God 20-something years ago. I'm getting closer to 30 now, I think. Over 25. Okay? Heard that ever since then. By his stripes, you were healed. To the point of it doesn't even mean anything anymore. Right? And that's something else I want to read in here is like, he is not a man that he should lie. What he said is true. What he has said, the the price he said Jesus has paid for us to be able to walk in is truth. It doesn't matter what we feel like. It doesn't matter what things look like. It doesn't matter what our circumstances are. What he says is truth. By his stripes we were healed. That is God's truth, right? If you stay in the inner court, don't go into the Holy of Holies, you just claim that, claim that, claim that. Speak it, speak it, write it on little papers, put it on your refrigerator, and pray and hope that maybe someday it might fall on you, right? And, and, and the longer you walk in that way, the further and further it gets from happening for you. The, further, the less and less you believe it, because you, you wrote it, you tried it, you did everything everybody said, and it doesn't work. So you think, well, this isn't true. And we are so, we, I don't know if we talked about this or I heard this somewhere else, but we are so... Living in a time where people don't do what they say and they lie about everything and they make things up and they promise you things and they don't deliver and they say things to you and they don't really mean it and they say one thing and they turn around and do something else. And we live in such a time, we are so skeptical right now of anything everybody says, it makes it harder and harder and harder for us to believe what we hear God say. And that's the design of it. That's why the enemy does it, right? But what he, he's not a man that he should lie. Everything that he says is truth. 
We have, it doesn't matter how my body feels. What he says is truth. And then you'll start to get to this place where you believe it no matter what. No matter what's going on, you said, by his stripes I am healed. That's one, the scripture I'm using because that's the one that had no meaning to me, right? It can be anything. It can be anything that he speaks to you in this word, anything he speaks to you in your spirit, right? It's truth. It doesn't matter what it looks like. What he says is truth. And when we start believing that and walking in that, no matter what, we start moving into the Holy of Holies. Then we start realizing what the blood of Jesus really did for us. It gave us something to hang on to, to say, this price has already been paid. I have to walk this out, right? Okay. All right, that's sermon number one. <laughs> All right, I want to go, the, one, the place I have been stuck over and over and over is Hebrews 6.1. And I kind of saw this in a little bit different light than how I read it in the past. Therefore, let us get past the elementary stage in the teaching about Christ, advancing on to maturity and perfection and spiritual completeness, doing this without laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of the faith toward God of teachings of washings, ritual purifications, and the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. These are all important matters in which you should have been perfected long ago. And we will proceed to maturity, if God permits. For it is impossible to restore to repentance those who have once been enlightened spiritually and who have tasted and consciously experienced the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted and consciously experienced the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away. It is impossible to bring them back again to repentance, since they again nailed the Son of God on the cross. For as far as they are concerned, they are treating the death of Christ as if they had, were not saved by it, and are holding him up again to public disgrace." For the soil that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and produces crops, useful for those for whose benefit it is cultivated, receive a blessing from God. But if it persistently produces thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. So when I always read and heard those scriptures in the past, it was always like, all right, somebody comes in here, they taste and they see and they touch and they know God and they get filled with the Holy Spirit and they have revelation and they have encounters with God and then they walk away and they leave and they don't come back and it's impossible to bring them back to repentance. That's what I've always saw it as. And, you know, maybe that's a layer of it. I don't know. But what I saw this time is <clears throat> I'm gonna, therefore let us get past the elementary stage of teachings about Christ, advancing on to maturity and perfection and spiritual completeness, doing this without laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works of faith toward God. What do most churches preach over and 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 over? Repent of your evil works and have faith in God. Repent in your evil works and have faith in God. Go up front, dedicate your life to God again. Repent of your evil works and have faith in God. Okay, he says, that's elementary. We should have been past that long ago. We're not to keep, you keep doing that over and over and over and over and over. You are going to produce a church of thorns and thistles. It, they don't necessarily have to walk away and go back out to the world. If they aren't moving on past that, if you're, teachings aren't moving on past that, you're going to produce a church of thorns and thistles, okay? And what does he call, the, what does, listen to, I want you to think about this now. We think dead, dry churches are churches that just sing hymns and read scripture by rote and whatever. He's calling the elementary things, so it is some of that, teaching about washings and purifications, the laying on of hands, right? So, me imparting something to you by laying on hands, he's calling that elementary. How many charismatic churches still live in that place, okay? The resurrection of the dead. Oh, my God. Like, are we seeing people 
raised from the dead? He's calling that elementary. And how many churches pray, uh, teach on that? Those are still the elementary things. Most churches, most all churches are still teaching on these elementary things. Jesus gave his blood and his life for us to move on past this into something greater than this. And here we are still stuck in the elementary things. And eternal judgment, okay? How many churches are still preaching that? Heaven or hell? Make your decision. If you die tonight, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell. Say the prayer so you go to heaven and not hell. Elementary. Long past. We're supposed to be long past those things, right? right. If, we keep te- if we keep trying to go back to that place of repentance and having faith in God, if we're constantly teaching that and constantly going back, okay, I'm not saying it's wrong to repent. Right. Repent means change your mind and do it God's way. And that, that's our walk. We do that. But it's bigger than these things. It's bigger than all these things that we're preaching. There's something so much greater than what we're preaching that I don't even know the fullness of what it all is yet, right? And he says, okay, and it says, for the soil that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and produces crops useful for those, useful to those, useful to those for whose benefit it is cultivated, receive a blessing from God. So if God is pouring down rain through his word in the church service, and we are soaking that in and growing on beyond these things, then we get blessings from God in that. But if it is pers- persistently produces thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. So if you're preaching repentance and have faith in God, and that's your only message, and you just preach that over and over and over, and you bring everybody back to that every week, and they just are sick of hearing it, really, because, you know, we don't know what to do beyond this. They're producing thorns and thistles, and they are in danger of being burned up. Whether that means hell, I don't know, but in this life, it means your works are burned up. It means you're not producing anything of life. You're only producing things of death. Okay. And I'm going to move to, I guess, 6, is that or 9. That's what we're ready for, Hebrews 6, 9. But beloved, even though we speak to you in this way, we are convinced of things, better things concerning you and of things that accompany salvation. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown for his name in ministering to the saints as you do. And we desire for each one of you to show the same diligence all the way through so as to realize and enjoy the full assurance of hope until the end so that you will not be spiritually sluggish, but will instead be imitators of those who have faith, who through faith lean on God with absolute trust and confidence in him and his power and by patient endurance, even when suffering are now inheriting the promises. For when God made the promise to Abraham, he swore an oath by himself since he had no one greater by whom to swear, saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, Abraham realized the promise in the miraculous birth of Isaac as a pledge of what was to come from God. Indeed, men swear an oath by one greater than themselves, and with them in all disputes the oath serves as confirmation of what has been said and is an end of the dispute. Okay, so again, when I read that, I thought, in our day and age, we have a hard time with that. But in their day and age, they were probably more men of their word, right? And when you had an oath, when somebody promised you something, you could walk through things and know that doesn't matter because I have been promised by this man that they're going to do that. He's going to do what he says, right? Okay, God swore by himself. There is no greater oath than that. And he is not a man that he should lie. And he is making huge and great promises. And I don't know if we'll get to it, but, you know, in Hebrews, I've read, I don't know, I've taught out of this many, many times, the rest that is promised. That means we are to have a rest from all, all, up to and including death, our enemies. We are supposed to have rest from all of our enemies, right? He made an oath with himself. That these are words that no matter what we're going through or what we're doing or what the circumstances look like or if it looks, my 
God, that's too big for me, God. I can't do that. I'm just this little peon person. And he says, no, this is what I've called you to do. He's not a man that he should lie. He made an oath. He made an oath with himself that the blood of Jesus would cover everything. He made an oath with himself that cannot be broken, no matter what the enemy says, no matter what your brain says, no matter what your body says, no matter what your heart says, no matter what the circumstances say, no matter what the world says, no matter what the church says, no matter what anybody says, he made an oath with himself that cannot be broken, that the blood of Jesus would cover absolutely everything. There's nothing that he hasn't done for us. We have to believe it and walk it out. We have to walk it out and believe what he has told us and walk it out. I know, I said walk it out like five times. <laughs> in the same way, God, in his desire to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable nature of his purpose, intervened and guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God to lie. I have been repeating this over and over and over and over. I want to know with everything within me that it is impossible for God to lie. Whatever he says is true, no matter what. We who have fled to him for refuge would have strong encouragement and indwelling strength to hold tightly to the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. It cannot slip and it cannot break down under whatever pressure bears upon it. A safe and steadfast hope that enters within the veil of the holy heavenly temple, that most holy place in which the very presence of God dwells where Jesus has entered in advance as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Mikkel, um, Mikkel, Mikkel. Yeah, that guy. And if you read in Hebrews, there's a lot about Melchizedek, um, the high priest that he was. And that, you know, they had priests that went in the, in, the Holy of Holies once a year to pay atonement for his and their sins, right? But it's, it talks about them, them dying out and how they couldn't, they couldn't cover everything forever and ever. That's why they had to go in there once a year. But Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek. He had no, no beginning and no end. And he wasn't, in, he wasn't a Levite. He wasn't in the line of the Levite priest. But he now lives forever so he can make atonement for us Forever. You got to go read all. There's a lot in that too that's really, really good. Okay. That was message number two. Um, I'm just going to quote this a little bit. Hebrews 1 1 talks about Jesus being the very essence and presence of his Father, the exact replica of who the Father is. Um, and it says, uh, Hebrews 1 3, the Son is the radiance and only expression of the glory of our awesome God and the exact representation and perfect imprint of his Father's essence, upholding and maintaining and propelling all things, the entire physical and spiritual universe, by his powerful word. Everything is maintained, propelled, and upheld, physically and spiritually, by his word. Because he's not a man that he should lie. Everything he says is true. This all, this all is held in place by his word. His word is so true, so real, so cannot be broken, it holds everything together. All matter, everything is held together by his word. Uh, Hebrews 2, 8, you have put all things in subjection. Okay, wait, 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 wait. I want to go back. Um, Uh, two five, it was not to angels that God suggest, subjected the world of the future when Christ reigns, about which we are speaking. But one has testified in Scripture, saying, "What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you graciously care for him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands." 
You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Now in putting all things in subjection to man, he left nothing outside his control. But at present, we do not yet see all things subjected to him. Okay, yeah, that's talking about Jesus, right? But it's also talking about man. All things were put in our control. God gave dominion of this earth to mankind. He gave it to Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve gave it away to the enemy. And Jesus came and paid the price to get it all back. We are to be in control of everything. Imagine walking like that where no enemy had control over you, where no sickness had control over you, where no uh, thing that a person said about you had control over you, where nobody could hurt you, where nobody could, could do anything to you. What did Jesus say? The, the, the enemy comes, but he has no place in me. That's, that's one of the promises. That is the promise that we're supposed to be in um, rest from all of our enemies. And God, God wanted the the Hebrew children to walk in that. He brought them out, giving them that promise, and they would not mix the words that he gave them with faith. And they died, their bodies strewn in the wilderness. This is all in Hebrews 2, right? Okay, and I was thinking this morning, you know, we've talked a lot about how we as the church are in the wilderness right now. We have, you know, things given to us, miracles. We have um, the presence of God with us day and night. But we haven't walked into the promised land to take that land where there is not a single enemy that has anything to do with us. And what happened? Their body, dead bodies were strewn all over the wilderness. What is happening to us? Our dead bodies are strew all over the world, right? We're put in graves all over the world. Death was never supposed to be. God did not intend mankind to die. That was never his plan, right? And our bodies are strewn everywhere because we will not believe and mix faith with the promises that God is giving us, right? But he's not a man that he should lie. He said there's going to be a people that walk in this. It's our choice whether we're going to stand up and, and become that people or whether we're going to let that promise move on to the next person. And God counts everything that we're doing as righteousness in this time. When we're trying so hard to walk this out, we're trying to believe him, and we're trying to say, God, these are the promises you made, and they're true, right? He counts that as righteousness. And, you know, in the Hebrews 11, one, it's the race of faith. All of the ones in the past who walked it out and believed what God said, and they died having not seen the promise, God counted it to them as righteousness. So we could die not seeing this promise, right? But let's go after it with everything we have because it's available to those who will believe what he's saying. It's available to those who will walk it out and lay down their soulish, self-centered lives to pick up his cross and follow him, right? (laughs) Hebrews 3, I'm not going to read it. I've read it so many times. Today, if you will hear his voice and not harden your heart. That's how it's going to work. Today, when we hear his voice, we don't, har- we don't harden our hearts. Because if he's got a purpose and a plan for us and a scroll that's written out for us, there's stuff we're supposed to do every day. If I don't follow it today and I'm too busy getting entangled with those things that are so cleverly pulling me and easily pulling me off, then today didn't get done. So now tomorrow he's got to speak it to me again. A week goes by, a month goes by, a year goes by. I just still didn't do it. All right, maybe I missed something now. Maybe I was supposed to partner with somebody. Maybe I was supposed to get healed. Maybe I was supposed to do something. Who knows what? But because for day after day, well, I'll do that tomorrow. Well, when I'm more spiritual, I'll do that. Oh, when I have more time, I'll spend more time with God and seek seek what he really wants me to do. Oh, I'll believe him when I see it. All of the things. Oh, I'm too fat. I'm too skinny. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm too far gone. I have too many things in my life. I'm too stuck on this. Around the mountain we go again and again and again. And years go by in people's lives, and they don't accomplish the things wrote on their scroll today. That's hardening your heart. We don't think it's hardening our heart because we say, well, I'll do it tomorrow, God, when I have more time. Or, you know, when I get a better revelation and I know you better and I understand you more, then I'll be able to do it. And we don't do what he asks us to do today then he can't give us what he had for us tomorrow because he still has to have what was supposed to be done today done. 
And if those things go past, then he's got to change the whole thing. And he's constantly got his hand out saying, just do what I'm asking you today. I'm not going to give you anything today that's too hard for you to do. Your flesh may not want to do it. It may seem too hard for you. I'm not going to give you what you're supposed to do next year today because you can't handle it. But I'll give you what you need to do today. But if you do, don't do it today, he calls that hardening of your heart. And all of those bodies were strewn in the wilderness because they wouldn't do what he asked them to do today. And they wouldn't believe the word that he was giving them today. And they didn't get to go into the promised land. The younger ones did, but the older ones didn't get to go in because they never walked out today what he asked them to do. They hardened their hearts. Man, we don't want to get stuck there, right? And again, you know, sometimes you say things, pray things that inside your flesh is going, oh my gosh, I wish I hadn't just said that. Because now when God comes to you, you're accountable. I'm sorry, you just heard what I said. So now, me too, I'm accountable. When God comes to me this afternoon and says something I don't want to do because I'm tired and I want to take a nap, I can't say, I didn't know because I just preached it. Okay. I'm just going to read starting in 15, 315, Hebrews 315. Today, while there is still opportunity, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as when they provoked me in the rebellion in the desert. For who were they who heard and yet provoked him with rebellious acts? Was it not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned? whose dead bodies were scattered in the desert. Why do you think God was angry about that? You think he was, like people, do people read that and think he was angry so he scattered their dead bodies in the desert? I think people think that. (laughs) But I think it's he was angry because he didn't want to see their dead bodies scattered in the desert. And he had a way where their dead bodies didn't have to be scattered in the desert. And he was angry because who wants to look at dead bodies scattered in the desert who don't have to be scattered in the desert? To whom did he swear an oath? There's that word again. So that's God's word. It's true. That they would not enter his rest, but to those who disobeyed, who would not listen to his word. So we see that they were not able to enter into his rest, the promised land, because unbelief and an unwillingness to trust in God. The first time I ever read that, I was floored. It wasn't because of their sin. It wasn't because they were human beings. It wasn't because they fell short of the glory of God. It was because they had unbelief and they were unwilling to trust the oath that God had made to and for them. Uh, I already quoted some of this and I'm going to read it again. I can't read what that is. For something. These letters are so small. Did I say 410? <laughs> uh, oh my gosh, right there. Is that a little 10? Right here? Yeah. Oh. He can't read. Oh, that's just a quote. Okay, okay. That's why I can't read it. No, it's three. It's 4 3. Because I thought that was a number, but it's just a quotation sign. No, no, I'm good. I was trying to make it into a number, and it wasn't a number. That's why I couldn't do it. Four, three. For we who believe, that is, we who personally trust and confidently rely on God, enter that rest just as he has said. As I swore an oath in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. This he said, oh, he said this, they shall not enter my rest because they wouldn't trust him, right? Although his works were completed from the foundations of the world, waiting for all those who would believe. These works, these promises, the promised land, the things I'm talking about, they were completed from the foundation of the world. They've been there waiting all along. They're just waiting for a people who will believe and walk them out. And, you know, we've talked before about believing can't be just agreeing in your mind. Whatever you do, however, okay, if, if I would, did go home this afternoon, like I said, I got a lot of things to work to do. I got work to do and I got things to get ready for, right? 
If I go home this afternoon and, I, and God speaks to me, I want you to spend three hours praying and spending time with me. And I say, well, I don't have time because I have all of this other stuff to do. What do I really believe? I believe that that stuff is more important than what God has spoken to me. And we can say all we want, well, I believe God. Oh, he doesn't care if I wait till tomorrow. Oh, but I have all this stuff to do. He'll understand. But if he's asked us to do something for him and we choose to do something else, we believe that thing to be more important than what he's speaking to us. And that's how those days and weeks and months and years go by and we don't accomplish the purposes and plans that God has for us. And there it all is. It's all there waiting since the foundation of the world for a people who will just believe him and do what he says. Okay, I'm going to then, I had a whole bunch more scriptures. Maybe I'll do some of this next time. I want to finish with kind of a little story. I, did I start out saying on here about, or did I say this before about, the shame, and we have a hard time letting God look into us, right? Okay. All of what I'm preaching on to you this morning is that there are elementary things that we want to do by being conformed. We don't want God to really look into us and see. This is a greater work to let him look into you and you look into his eyes as he looks into you. Do you understand what I'm saying? He sees us. We're open and naked before him all the time, right? It says that in 412. He knows everything. He knows everything we've ever done, everything we're ever going to do, everything that was ever done to us. No surprise to him, right? Whatever you're going through right now, no surprise to him. And he already paid the price for it, right? Okay, but what he wants us to do is trust him. You have to know him and trust him to be able to look into his eyes as he looks into your soul and sees the stains. Jan and I were talking this morning. I have these white pants on for the first time today, and I was thinking about the reason the bride wears white and a reason he wants clean white flesh, white horse to ride on his white flesh. How easy is it for stains to show up on white? You can't hide them very well, right? So if we're wearing white in his presence and there's a stain, it's very easily seen. Okay, how hard is it to look into his eyes and trust that he loves you enough and know his character and nature enough to look in his eyes and see him looking into you and seeing the stains that are on you and knowing and trusting and believing that he will, that he will, can, and already has set you free from that thing and that he will, can, and already has put in place a way for you to be able to walk through that and come out of that and get that stain off of there. And it's hard to get stain out of white clothes, especially blood. <laughs> right? Okay. So, I didn't know if I was going to share this or not. Okay. So, when we were doing popcorn last week, week before last, um, okay, I'm going to go back further than that. God had spoken to me in January of 2022, and he told me to get my finances in order and to get my health in order. And he walked me through a whole bunch of things to do that. And I started, he had us walk through the financial part first, which I think was needed to be able to buy some of the stuff I'm having to do to get through the health part of it, right? So um, up to that point, I had been having some weird blood issues, okay? So that's why this means so much to me. I know what it feels like to have blood coming out of you in places it shouldn't be and not knowing why. And then a few years before I started getting healthy, Nosebleeds. I started having some nosebleeds, okay? My mom, when I was a teenager, had terrible nosebleeds to the point that she bled out a quart of blood one time, passed out, hit her face on the table, and completely broke her lip up and everything. 
And all it was, come to find out, is she had a vein too close to the outer edge, and they just cauterized it, and she never had a problem with it again. But they didn't know for a long time what was causing it. And like I remember at least a year, maybe two years, she dealt with that. Okay, I, I had no idea the emotional part of stuff that goes with that, right? My nosebleeds would never have been that bad, right? I could usually get them stopped within a little bit. Sometimes they were worse than others. But you're like, okay, what do I do here, God? Do you want me to go to the doctor? What is this? What's causing this? How do I get these to stop? Like, you're a little scared because there's blood coming out of you, right? And that wasn't the only place blood was coming out of me, okay? More than one other place blood was coming out of me. And it's like, what do I do, God? You want me to go to the doctor? You want me, what do you want me to do? What do I do? And, of course, when the enemy is doing something like to, there's to you like this, there's bombardment of things that it can be. And, of course, everything you see in here has to be, oh, my so-and-so had this, and it was this, and my so-and-so had that, and that was that, right? And so you're, you're fighting this thing, and you don't know what to say. You don't know what to tell people. You don't know what to speak out loud. You don't know if you're supposed to go to the doctor. You want to trust God. You, like, yes, I don't, I'm not against going to the doctor, but there has to come a place in time where we trust what he has said by his oath, right? You can go to a doctor, and they can sometimes give you things that make you worse off instead of better, Right? And even I'm going to read that. The woman with the issue of blood. She had spent all that she had on doctors and had gotten no better but, in fact, got worse. Right? Okay, I'm not against going to the doctor if God tells me to go to the doctor because they do have things that heal people. Right? He never told me that. All I ever felt like was just keep trusting me. Just keep trusting me. Keep trusting me. Keep trusting me. So in January of this year, 2024, if you're watching this later, um, he started having me take some supplements and different things, and all the bleeding stopped, all of it. I've had no bleeding for several months now, none, anywhere. It's like, praise you, God. Thank you, God, right? Okay, I backed up on one of the supplements for a little bit. When we were in there a couple weeks ago, nosebleed. Just out randomly, I'm working. We're fast, going, working, got a lot of line, and I reach up, blood on my finger. So that one wasn't too bad, stopped it. Five times in three days I had nosebleeds, and one of them was pretty, it wasn't bad like I thought I was going to pass out and die, but I had like a huge, ugly, clotty thing come out of it, right? And all while we're working, well, it happened in the motel room a night, too, and then again later, but um, three times while we were working, and kind of busy the last day, when the really bad one was, we weren't really busy. So I'm sitting in the truck, and I'm praying, and I'm like, God, like, okay, I'm telling you, this is why I know the things that came on Jesus, because you have all these things bombarding you, thoughts bombarding you, of like, God, what do I do, you know, what do I, what is this, this is so weird, what is this, like, that thing that came out of my nose was weird looking, what is this, is like, that the end of it, and it's done, that was the thing causing the problem, or is that a clot, or what is that, you know, so I'm sitting in the truck and I'm praying, and James was getting in and out of the truck. We had two kids helping us, so he'd go make sure they were doing okay, and then he'd come back and he'd pray with me. And this scripture of the woman with the issue of, woman with the issue of blood had been coming to me before all of this started. Like, it's been a scripture that I've went to several times because I've had issues with bleeding, right? So I, I tell James, I'm like, it said that she just knew if she could touch the hem of his robe that she would be healed. And I said, wouldn't it be so much easier if I could just touch the hem of his robe physically and get healed? How do you do that spiritually? And James is like, yeah, right. I'm like, well, you're no help, you know. And so I'm just sitting there, and I'm crying out to God, and I'm praying in tongues. And it came back to me what Mike had said that I shared with you earlier about Jesus took every personal thing. And I'm just sitting there, and I'm just declaring Jesus took this nosebleed, this one, this one that's happening right now. He took this on him. This should not be happening to my body. He already paid the price for it. I'm going to believe what you said, that you already paid the price for it. So it, it stopped, and that, and that wasn't it. I had two more after that, I think. Okay, they weren't as bad, but I had them. Okay. Still bombarding thoughts, right? Okay. So the next, we took a, a couple days off then after that, and we stayed in a motel, and so he had went to go get something, pop or something, and, and so I read this scripture again. And this, uh, and this account of this woman with the issue of blood is in three 
of the Gospels. I think it's a pretty important story, okay? And <clears throat> Mark 5.25 is my favorite, so that's the one I'm going to read to you. A woman in the crowd had suffered from hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much suffering at the hands of many physicians. She spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but instead became worse. She had heard reports about Jesus, and she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his outer robe. For she thought, if I just touch his clothing, I will get well. Immediately, her flow of blood was dried up, and she felt her body and knew without any doubt that she was healed of her suffering. Immediately, Jesus, recognizing in himself that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in around you from all sides, and you ask who touched me? Still, he kept looking around to see the woman who had done it. And the woman, though she was afraid and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith, your personal trust and confidence in me has restored to help, restored you to help. Go in peace and be permanently healed from your suffering. So I'm reading all of these accounts and I'm starting to cry because I understand what this woman feels like and all she did was touch the hem of his garment. Jesus, how do I touch the hem of your garment? How do I, how do I get what this woman got? It's available to me. I know it is, right? So I'm just kind of doing some looking around on the internet and I come across this. It's like somebody's, what they wrote about what happened in the crowd that day, right? It wasn't just the tug of a hand Jesus had felt. It was the tug of a heart. It was the tug of faith that he sensed. He knew someone had reached out to him in faith. Jesus scanned the crowd looking for who it was. He wasn't about to let this woman get lost in the crowd. This woman came up to Jesus from behind. Jesus wanted her to come face to face with him, though. He wasn't satisfied just to be this lady's healer. He didn't want her to remain nameless and faceless. He wanted this woman to know that he knew her. He wanted to become her God, her king, her lover, her heavenly father. This story lets us know that God always wants to make himself personal to us. Jesus wanted a real relationship with this woman. He didn't want to just be a mystical force who can touch and heal. He wanted to be a personal God who was real, loving, and personal. He is not satisfied until we come face to face with him. She finally fell at his feet, grateful for his touch, fearful of his rejection. Jesus said, daughter, your faith has healed you. This woman had not heard tender words from a man in more than 12 years. She had the words unclean written on her heart. Just like that, though, Jesus wrote a new name on her heart. Not content to just touch her physical body, he spoke love and acceptance in her heart. Now she was healed, really healed, and she would never be the same again. And then it says, and that's the word, the word. We're supposed to believe the word. And so this is what I wrote. I feel like every time something is wrong in my body, that I come to Jesus ashamed and I feel like a failure that I should have more faith and be stronger against the enemy than I am. I come to him from behind and sheepishly want to touch the hem of his garment. Unnoticed, but he wants to look in the eye face to face and give me all that he is. We want to just sneak up behind Jesus. like the, That's what the inner, that inner court is. Not the Holy of Holies, but that inner court where we're conformed into what everybody else says is we want to sneak up behind him and touch the hem of his garment. We want him to be our healer. Just heal me, and then, then you can look at me. Just heal this place in me, and then you can look at me. Okay? Those are the elementary works. As long as that place is still in, in place in our lives, as long as that inner cord is still working in our lives, we can't get into the Holy of Holies. He wants us to turn around and look at him face to face, in the eye, and he says, I see the stains in you. I saw them. I saw them from day one when Adam did what he did. I saw them through all of humanity, all the things that have happened. I saw them. They've already, 
They've always been there. You're just now seeing them. I've always seen them. And he's wanting a people who will turn around and look at him face to face, eye to eye, and say, I see you looking at me. I'm going to look into your eyes as you see the stains in me and as you set them clean. And it says, you have been made clean by the word that I gave you. It's, we have been made clean by the oath that he has spoken, by the promises that he has made. He is true. He is not a man that he should lie. These things are real and done and in place, and they have been since the foundation of the earth, just waiting for a people who will believe what he says, that will turn around and look, not sneak up behind him in the crowd, not try to just let him, not, we just want him to take care of this thing, this thing that's bothering me right now. And he says, no, I want to be your king. I want to be your Lord. I want to be your everything. Turn around and look at me. Let me see you. Look at me eye to eye as I take care of this stuff, as I discipline you, as I, as I put in place new things for you to live and walk by. This is how we're going to get past the elementary things, is when we become so in love with him, so trusting of him, so able to look at him as he changes us, that all of that stuff doesn't matter anymore. And that it has no hold of us anymore. It has no place in us anymore. That's what he's looking for. That's what we're going to have to walk out. That's what we're trying to become. We've got to get beyond the elementary things. The things that seem so big to us, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, all that stuff seems so big to us. And he says, that's just elementary. Get past that. i got so much more for you to do. There's a big scroll written on the hearts of the people in God's place, God's churches. Okay, that's it for today. <laughs> Anybody have anything? Nothing? You? No? All right, Lord, help us walk this out. Amen. Help us wrap our minds around this. Help us get beyond the elementary things, God. You are looking for a mature bride to walk by your side. And, God, we want to be a part of that. We so want to be a part of that. Our hearts long more and more. The more and more we see you, the more and more we look into your eyes, the more and more we know your nature and character, the more we fall in love with you, and the more we want to stand with you and walk beside you and accomplish everything that you have planned. Father, we just thank you that you've given us a bridegroom. And it talks in... Um, Hebrews 2 about like he knows he knows everything, all the sufferings. He is not a high priest that does not understand the things that we're going through. Oh my gosh, what a pair you're making, God. What a pair you're making in the bridegroom and the bride. Let us wrap our minds around it that with your spirit and by your spirit we can become that. It seems too big for us right now. It seems too much. It seems too Holy, it seems too far beyond who we're supposed to be. But God, you said, you said it was available for those who would believe and trust you. And you made an oath, and you're not a man that you should lie. So it is true. There will be a people who walk this out. God, today, we, God, we can't look beyond and do beyond today. Just speak to us what we're supposed to do today, and let us be obedient to that. Let us not harden our hearts to what you speak to us to do today. We just praise you and honor you and glorify you and magnify you and defer to you and prefer you and esteem you. And we notice you and we love you exceedingly, God. We enjoy you. We're excited to be with you. Like a bride is excited to be with her husband. We just praise you for everything. Amen. <laughs>